Dave Chang Show, part of the Ringer Podcast Network, presented by Major Domo Media. This amazing song is Pass the Hatchet by Yola Tango, and I am excited to say that we have two amazing guests, Ryan Johnson, the fantastic director, most recently of The Last Jedi Star Wars, and Karina Longworth, formerly of the LA Weekly Film Critic and probably one of the best podcasts out there. You must remember this. Highly recommend you listen to her narrate some of the lost stories of old Hollywood. I think it sheds a lot of cool light on present day culture. I've gotten to know Ryan and Karina over the past couple of years, and I'm trying really hard in this podcast to not geek out, number one. Number two, this is incredibly nerve wracking. And in retrospect, I wish that I had just had one person to interview because there are two individuals that I respect enormously. And I was a little bit nervous. And I think you can hear that because I, I don't know what to do. And what I mean, I don't know what to do is this is a different form for me. I'm stuck in a kitchen or not doing things like this on the norm. And while I've done TV, I think the podcast is a completely different medium, and I'm going to try my best to get better at this, but I didn't want to mess anything up for Ryan or Karina. The one thing I want to say is this, is I don't know in the interview, I expressed how much of a fan I was of Last Jedi. When I originally saw it on opening night, I didn't know if Last Jedi was what I was expecting. And because of that, I wasn't disappointed, I was confused, I was angry because I didn't expect Ryan to take the trajectory of the most recent Star Wars to a level that had never happened before in the previous franchise. It was completely new, it was completely different, and in so many ways I felt like it challenged me and it took me a long time to process. And then I saw it again, and then I saw it again, and I've probably seen it a dozen times at home or on on the plane and travel. And it's one of those movies I'm going to see again and again and again. And I think it's probably the best in the series, which I think a lot of people would say maybe not because it's so, I wouldn't say polarizing. I think that people need to look at it again. And I know a lot of the Star Wars orthodoxy, I think we're upset because he did something different. And I think that they really need to look at the nuance and the position he was in. And I thought it was super interesting to have Ryan talk to me about criticism, something that I've been wrapping my head around as of late because of all the good criticism and bad criticism that I've received. And it's something I've working really hard in my life to be a little bit more objective about and not take it so personally, which I don't know if I'll ever get to, which is why I thought for the first, one of the first guests of this pod to ask Ryan and Karina to talk about it because Karina is a critic. So it was always interesting to me that you have a film creator and a film critic, even though Karina doesn't review movies anymore. She'll explain as to why she doesn't do present day movie genre. But it was really interesting to me that I could get a perspective about criticism from a critic. And even though it's not food criticism, I was hoping that this show, even though it's going to dive deep into food is going to be able to have parts of it that anyone in all walks of life will be able to like take into their own life because there are a lot of similarities and patterns throughout culture. For instance, you know, food criticism, I think, has a lot of similarities with film criticism, particularly the emotions involved. And while film and food are very different, how and why and the subjectiveness of reviewing something, I think, is super interesting to talk about and the art of reviewing. And I'm not going to speak forever about this, but I just wanted to let you guys know that I didn't shower them with enough praise because I was so, so stoked that they came in. I didn't expect them to say yes, because like this is one of my first tries at interviewing anyone in this format. So I was really lucky, very fortunate. So big shout out to Karina and Ryan for being my guinea pigs here. So without further ado, Karina Longworth and Ryan Johnson. I'm joined by two amazing guests, Karina Longworth and Ryan Johnson, two amazing storytellers in their own right. And to be honest, I'm quite nervous about doing this. Oh, please. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> so, um, Little old us. Yeah. If you don't know Karina, Karina was a former film critic at the LA Weekly, has written several books, has a new one coming out soon. 
about Howard Hughes. It's in November, yeah. And has a fantastic podcast called You Must Remember This that goes into stories of the old Hollywood. Yep. (laughs) And Ryan Johnson, director of Brick, uh, (laughs) Brothers Bloom, one of my favorite episodes on Mad Men ever. Um, Breaking Bad. Although I'll take credit for Mad Men if you want. Oh (laughs) shit! Leave that in. I want credit for a Mad Men episode. Leave that in. Mad Men too. (laughs) Um, Actually, Looper is probably one of my favorite films, and then most recently, Last Jedi. So honored to have you guys both here. And one of the reasons I was so excited was something that's happening in my life. I think that you guys can maybe shed light on, and then I'll just stop talking. (laughs) <laughs> so I, I don't believe it. We, uh, I don't believe it when I see it. <laughs> we uh, <laughs> we are uh, opening up a new restaurant in Midtown in the Time Warner Center, and it's going to be a new Momofuku noodle bar. And a recent event where my staff there was having a hard time distinguishing what we need to do new and what we need to keep as a legacy of a 15-year-old restaurant. And it's been really hard for people to understand that nuance of deciding to take a risk on something new, to break away from the old and what is in, what is out in the sense of like what's authentic Mm -hmm. and what needs to change. And I can't think of a better two people to talk about in the sense of two content creators, two people that have had an interesting story about criticism and creation of stuff. So Mm -hmm. Ryan, could you tell me how you feel about that? Mm -hmm. Like with Last Jedi, I felt like I can relate to a lot of the stuff that happened Yeah, in terms of the success and also the orthodoxy of Star Wars. Yeah, no, there are definitely parallels. I would be curious to hear in terms of like the creation of the new noodle bar, for example. Like, I feel like you can't really enter into it as a calculation, I guess. Like, I'm just talking about me with Star Wars. Like, I grew up with Star Wars being a huge part of my life. And when I was a little kid, it wasn't just like, I love the movies. It was really like kind of my world. It was the world that I played in with my imagination. And so I got just deep roots personally. That means that Star Wars means something to me. And so I've got that base to build on in my heart. It doesn't mean that's going to line up with what everybody thinks. But anyway, when I came into writing The Last Jedi, I don't know, the writing process felt really kind of natural and joyful. It didn't feel daunting. I just kind of jumped into it. I think part of that was because I just kind of went into it knowing what I loved about it and then using that as a base to explore stuff that was going to get me excited right now, you know? And it it wasn't like putting it up on a whiteboard and saying, we need 80% of the old stuff and 20% of new stuff. We have to be careful not to push it. To, it wasn't any of that. It was literally just feeling it out and we were continuing the story of The Force Awakens. And so I had a starting point and I had kind of a trailhead to go from So it wasn't about some big grand idea of Star Wars and what do we keep the same and what do we change. It was about a group of characters who were in a certain situation. How do they move forward in the most interesting way and doing it in a way that felt Star Warsy to me? I'd be curious if it's the same with you or if it is more of like a put it all up on the board and kind of figure out what do we keep, what do we toss? Or is it more of like, a? it's more like hacking your way forward through a forest with machete rather than being in a helicopter above the forest and city planning, I guess. You know? Basically, we want to hear like, what is your version of we have to kill Snoke? Yes, <laughs> right. Okay. Spoiler. <laughs> um, for myself, there's a little bit of formulating an, uh, an idea. I wouldn't say percentages, but a lot of it is just what my gut tells me that I should do. What feels right to me. Mm-hmm. And I hope to God that it's clear to someone that's eating it. Mm. And... For a lot of this stuff, whether it's Noodle Bar or Major Domo or anything, when you try to change anything new in terms of a guest perception, that's a really risky proposition. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and I find that the Star Wars orthodoxy is somewhat similar to the food orthodoxy, whether it's Italian food, Korean food here in LA, yeah. or people that eat Chinese food in the San Gabriel Valley. If you mess with something, people get pissed. Yeah. And I want to know what the threshold is for it to be successful because nothing moves forward unless you do something new. And for instance, I think what you did with The Last Jedi is incredibly ballsy, risk-taking. And I don't know if you got enough credit for doing that in the sense that I think you embody everything that Star Wars should be. And it took me a long time to come to that conclusion Mm. because it's not the easy road. I think 
ultimately the riskier thing though is to not do that. This is going to sound like maybe just like a justification after the fact that I do genuinely believe this. You know and I mean? Like the riskier thing is just to turn the organ grinder handle and just put out the same tune. That's how you go stale and that's how you fail. The only way that you actually land with people, which is why I tell stories, it's why yeah, I'm guessing you write, it's why you make food, is to actually like connect with people through this thing that you care about is to have it live, have it be alive. And the only way to do that is to not be constantly thinking in your head, oh crap, are people going to like this if I do this thing that they aren't expecting? That way lies death. I, I really do believe that. Well, when you do that, it's still yeah, people a painful are not, process. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to be willing to take criticism and, and understand that if you're doing exactly what you want to do, not everybody's going to like it, especially if it breaks a mold that they're expecting. But I just personally want to explore it. I just, that's why I'm so honored to have you guys talk about this because to me, the things that are worth exploring are the things that sort of challenge the establishment. Mm. And just because I'm challenging it or you're challenging the preconceived notion of what Star Wars should be doesn't mean that you're not honoring it. I think that you're trying to honor it by actually changing it. It's the only way to honor it. In my case, if, if George Lucas had been thinking of walking on eggshells in order to not make anybody upset or confused, he would never have made the movies that he made. The only way to honor it is to keep it alive. To me, the argument that you just have to hash out what you've had, you know, bring back out the stuff everyone recognizes in the same way they always have seen it so that they can recognize it and feel good about it. That to me dishonors Star Wars because Star Wars is about surprising you in delightful ways is what these movies have always done, I think. There was that great story of when George Lucas was making the first Star Wars, he had this early screening and he showed it to all of his friends and they all went out for Chinese food after. And it's like Brian De Palma is like, you're finished, George. You've made a huge mistake. <laughs> and like Francis Ford Coppola is like, cut your losses, like throw it away. And only Spielberg was like, actually, yeah, I think there's something here. <laughs> and of course, they're all wrong except for Spielberg. But isn't that interesting though? I, I've always found whatever field you're in, when you're trying to endeavor to do something new and different, yeah, it really is on that like razor's blade edge of being total junk or being something that's transcendent. Mm. And that's that nauseous feeling that I'm sort of addicted to and terrified. Yeah. And I never want to have the criticism. Right. And I feel like when I watched Star Wars Last Jedi, it was in some ways the only way to move it forward. The best way to pay respect, again, was to almost destroy what came before it. If that makes any sense. It's like a paradox. Mm. Hmm. Sort of. I mean, I was not destroy, but like yeah. to move it forward, you have to do something different. And I think that's hard to understand. I, I guess so. I guess I don't think of moving forward and trying new stuff as destroying what came before. And that's ultimately the kind of theme of the movie is not you have to destroy the past, it's you have to build on the past to move forward. But I think the thing that you're butting up against and the thing you keep talking about is just this immovable fact, which is when you tell something that comes, like Karina said, when you tell something that comes from your heart and you try and, and you, you are going to end up taking chances and going outside the norms, there are going to be people who don't like it. They're going to say mean stuff and you're not going to feel good. And I don't mean to just say that like dismissing it. It really doesn't feel good and it's a big thing. And, and I'm still, we'll all be kind of learning the rest of our lives, how to integrate that into both our lives and the next creative thing you do. Criticism to me is something that I'm, Still wrapping my head around. It's necessary because it's a checks and balance. But we live in a day and age where it's more and more ruthless. The Chinese walls are like sort of blurred between, at least in my industry of cooking, between the critic and the person that's like making the food. There's so many people know everything and everyone mm -hmm. that it's hard to distinguish if it's useful anymore. And not that your relationship with Ryan is about that criticism, but I always found it interesting because I was trying to understand it myself. If someone I knew was also a food critic, how would that work? And as a critic that did a lot of work at LA Weekly and you wanted that job and <laughs> you reviewed, I don't know how many movies, many of which it seemed that you didn't love yourself. You just yeah. had to do it, right? Like, Well, that was actually the number one reason why I quit being a newspaper film critic was because you're expected to see every movie that comes out like, you know, 10 or 12 a week and have an opinion about all of them. Like even if you don't actually write a review, you're supposed to be able to like go on the radio and talk about them or like weigh in on Twitter about how you feel about a movie. And 
I mean, I don't know how it is with you in restaurants, but like for me, as somebody who really, really cares about movies, there's probably only like three or four that come out in a week that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like you're faking enthusiasm for things that you would never care about. Or not even faking enthusiasm, but like you just have to engage with things that like you would never care about. And sometimes you do make discoveries, but more often than not, it's just sort of like this mind numbing amount of information that you have to like take in and then regurgitate. But when you would write criticism, if it was a bad review, were you ever thinking, how would this person that made this film feel about it? Because I understand Mm -hmm. that you have to be ruthless simultaneously, but what if someone gave their best effort and it was all that they had and it just didn't live up to your expectation? Like, how do you reward that effort without trying to rip someone up? I mean, honestly, that's, I don't think that's the job of a critic to care about the artist's feelings. And so that's why it's really difficult, I think. And I, you know, was very careful not to take the assignment to write about the thing that a friend made. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more friends I make in the industry, the less feasible it is for me to be a film critic. Partly it was in myself with what you just said about being ruthless about the artist's feeling. I think it's in this world where connections are, are there in food. Like what I mean is a chef will know a critic and they'll know their universe. And it's hard for a critic to act and work anonymously. And I don't know how, if you know someone, if you know the chef, how do you recuse yourself? Like, right. I know that happens, but maybe it doesn't happen enough. Well, also then it's like, in terms of, let's say, Jonathan Gold at the LA Times, like, I'm sure they do have other food critics there, but he's the best and the highest profile one. So you want him to review your restaurant. Like, you don't want the second stringer to do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I am not, I want, I, I have some giant elephant in the room. Like, when I did Momofuku Noodle Bar Cookbook, and Peter Mian stopped writing anything about me. Mm-hmm. And you see that throughout. But for some critics, like, for instance, in London, I know a lot of the food critics, they don't care. It's just, I'm going to write whatever I want to write. And I think this process with gold has been really interesting because I'm trying to take the high road. Did you talk to him after the review? No, didn't even talk to him during it. But I, I was telling my wife that I wish that Mueller could intervene and <laughs> investigate this. Because I want to go on the record and I want to tell everyone exactly what happened. <sighs> but I feel like if you talk about it, it's going to come across as petty. And it's something that I feel the critic will always win, mm. right? Yes, Do you feel that, that way? Absolutely. Even if the yeah, critic is potentially wrong. There's, there's no, but it's not even winning, losing. There is no upside to engaging in a dialogue about a review. There's no, absolutely no upside to it. But this opens up a bigger conversation, which is kind of what is the purpose of criticism? Because there are a couple different sides to it. There's kind of the consumer reports side of it, which is how is a review going to affect whether people want to come see my movie or come to my restaurant? I know how it is in the restaurant business. In the in the movie business, that has changed somewhat. I think on Broadway, there's still the thing of you wait for the New York Times review and that's going to make or break you. And It you know, definitely is. It still exists for indie films. And for indie, I mean, yeah. for like the 15 movies that are released in a week in New York City, like three of them are major studio releases. Mm. And the others are fighting for people to like choose to buy those tickets. But is it, Rotten Tomatoes and the aggregate score that that I mean, matters, I'm sure it depends it, on the movie, but I think it's probably more like the New York Times review, right? If they trust like Wesley Morris or whichever critic they trust, and that's the movie that they recommend that week, like that's what people will go see. It's a little bit different in LA because there's not as big of a indie movie scene here, but for those movies that get smaller releases, criticism is still super important. That's like one whole side of it. Then there's. Like, I just have always been a fan of film criticism as writing. I still am. I just enjoy reading it. So speaking entirely in that realm, reviews are not written for the filmmaker. They're not a grade. They're not telling the filmmaker what they did wrong. They are writing about their experience of the movie. And so even even kind of like the cliched thing of the artist puts his balls on the chopping block and then the critic is standing up in their ivory tower just throwing spitballs down at them from a protected place. That's never really made sense to me because when I read a good movie review written by an interesting writer whose perspective really is interesting to me, they're not even really telling me about the movie. I'll go see the movie and have my experience of that film. They're not telling me how I'm going to feel watching the movie. They're telling me about themselves. They're mm. telling, they're revealing how they interacted. And a, a good movie review, even sometimes 
a poorly written movie review will do this even more so <laughs> kind of without the right without right. the critic realizing it tells you much more about the critic than it does about the movie i think and i think that jonathan gold's review of major domo tells you it's like 60% about him it's like about the way he looks at restaurants his experience of like being the guy he is in la who's like the expert on mini mall ethnic food yeah it, i have so many thoughts on what i've told myself that i would wait a year before I wanted to like <laughs> Let's publicly get together talk about in a year. It. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot there. And that's why I, I don't joke. It's like I would love someone to sort of mediate because I got nothing yeah. to hide. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the things that I think are meaningful to talk about. Yeah. If a critic has bias, that's a dangerous problem. But what is defined bias though? What is bias and what is expertise? <laughs> yeah. And what is just a personal take, which is ultimately what their job is, is to write their experience of it. It's all bias. I mean. But it's interesting though. Food, I think, is one of the very, maybe the only form of criticism that is so ephemeral, mm. which is why you hope a critic will eat two, three, four times. Mm. And even still, that's just a small window because it's a living organism that's going to evolve. When you make a movie right. and that's final edit, unless you do like a Criterion Edition extended thing, right. it's never really going to change. Right. And yeah, it's true. Even if you do a theater, yep. someone might videotape it. You might watch it, a book, right. music. These are things that are become, they become permanent and a critic can go back to it again and again and again. Right. But for a meal, it's such an in the moment feeling of what the critic I think is thinking about and where mm. they're at. Mm. That I feel can be dangerous at times, mm. which is why I always wonder if a critic is in a bad mood. Like if we say that someone's uh, significant other was like on their deathbed, that would affect their work, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. But then how can they remove that kind of emotion from their review? Right. Yeah. Critics are critics are people. <laughs> Controversial statements. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's everything that they're experiencing. Jim Hoberman, who was the film critic for The Village Voice for 30 years, and he was my professor in graduate school at NYU, he had this quote that I really liked that was something like, the job as a critic is simply to write a report about what it felt like to be in that room while you were watching the movie. And so that suggests that like it shouldn't be about anything but that single experience of watching the film. Like You don't bring in your baggage from what happened to you that day or what's going on in your life. But it's like a really difficult thing to... As a writer of anything, it's a really difficult thing to exclude who you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, this is such a <laughs> tough thing to talk about. I can see you tip-tapping <laughs> over like a lot of things in right. your head that you're like. <laughs> because I feel like when I see Last Jedi, people are like, you need to understand you dedicated your life to this film for many years. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, yeah, like four, four years. years. Yeah, sure. Everything that you could have done, you did. Yeah. And I feel the same way about Major Domo, for instance. And I know objectively it's a great restaurant. Yeah. And many of the reviews have been fantastic. Yeah. And it's just hard when I think there's a healthy dose of narcissism because you want everyone to love it. It's interesting how it's you can get 99 glowing reviews. And, and the you one, only believe the negative ones. Only believe the <laughs> negative ones. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just like that in life. You know, if somebody gives me a compliment, I'm like, well, they don't mean it. But if somebody says like, you made a mistake here, that'll burn inside me for days. <laughs> We're very similar in that regard. <laughs> Did you ever write a review where you regretted because you had new life experiences that made you realize that maybe that review was short-sighted and that you could have mm -hmm. gone back in time and were like, the artist was right, I was wrong? Well, I don't know about the artist being right <laughs> and me being wrong, but I've definitely done that. Like the most, I guess, like prominent time I did that was at, I was at the Cannes Film Festival and I saw Inglorious Bastards and it was like a thing where I had to like get up at six in the morning, get in line for two hours and then watch it at eight in the morning and then write about it immediately, you know, like file my review by noon. And I was just kind of mixed on it. And then I saw it two months later in New York City and I like, saw the movie in a different way. I saw things in it. It felt richer to me. And so I wrote about it for a second time. And I was like, I was wrong the first time. Like, I didn't see the movie in its fullness. And like, these are the things that I find really interesting about it now. And then like years later, I interviewed Quentin Tarantino and he had read both of the reviews <laughs> and was very snarky to me about it. See, that's not what I want to be. Like, <laughs> I might privately be snarky, but I want to come across as like being gracious. They watched it and if they don't like it, they don't like it. But that's a rare thing where a critic would write a new review. It happens in restaurants. A critic will come back after a two, three year stretch. But it's just very hard for me to articulate because, for instance, when I think about Last Jedi, mm. for myself, when I watched it the first time, I had mixed feelings because I was 
push way out of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. There was things I didn't like, and it's not like I didn't like it. I didn't like it because it challenge my assumptions of what star Wars is supposed to be. Hmm. And then now that I've watched it like a dozen times, right. right. I'm like, Oh, I'm such an idiot. And it's that <laughs> idiot feeling that I love where well, I'm man, like, and I've done my job. Yeah. You feel like, and then, no, no, but like part of that is like, I can see that where, because you spent so much time in it, yeah, you knew your vision was right. And it just sometimes takes someone else's change in perspective to see what you're trying to do. And how do you know a critic will ever change that perspective? Well, but what does it matter? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask too. Especially, I mean, especially for a film where it's, it is like, once you're done with it, you're done with it. And all you can do is hope that it has a life at all. I think that if you're doing something and it's successful at all, and you feel that you're doing exactly what you want to do, and there's like a small amount of criticism that's negative, then you just have to live with that. Like you can't change what you're doing to make the haters happy. Right. Mm. I don't know what it says about me that I need to make everyone happy. <laughs> I mean, it says you're a human being. <laughs> I think it's a very human thing. I don't know. I, I have the same feeling. But yeah, it's you're right. It just it's something that is going to be there, and you gotta. But you don't believe that there's like it. some universal. I don't want to use the word platonic truth in work, but like yeah. something that is like a beacon that everyone can see that it's great. No, there's a beacon where everyone can see, oh, that's fine. There's a beacon of comfortableness, I think. That mm-hmm. can be a universal thing. But something that's truly great, something that truly goes for it, no, it's never going to be universal. And I know that should be incredibly comforting. I know we all probably know that intellectually in our heads. It doesn't help when you're sitting on the internet reading someone, <laughs> you know, yeah. tear you to pieces or something. I know emotionally it doesn't help, but I think we all know that something true because of our experience with stuff that is truly great out there especially when it first comes out mm. uh, over time, things get gilded over time, everything kind of, but I mean, you know, famously like the empire strikes back. There's not what people were expecting when it came out. And I'm not making, I'm not saying last Jedi is as good as like, you know, I'm not making that direct comparison, but just as an example of something that's gilded today and at the time had a very mixed reception to it that people tend to forget about over the years. But then you have podcasts like your show. You must remember this that I think is like, you're trying to get a better understanding of what actually happened. Right. So I think it's a continuous process about analyzing what's happened in the past. This is the best form of authenticity and like the best, like the best case scenario where you're trying to preserve something. You're trying to explain a story where people may not know the truth behind right. something. And I think that's super interesting because at least for myself, but now that you're a creator of stuff, you are also getting criticized as a critic too. Like, how did that feel? Well, I have to be honest that I got more like negative feedback when I was a film critic than I do now. <laughs> when I was a film critic, I would get it from other critics. I would get it from commenters, you know, on reviews. Sometimes filmmakers would reach out to me angrily, although, I mean, that only happened like a handful of times. And now I've just been very surprised and lucky, but almost all the feedback I get on the podcast is positive. And the stuff that is negative is usually just baldly misogynistic. And it's just like, I don't like your voice, you know? I don't understand how someone could like not like the podcast. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it does only good things, you know? I mean, I make mistakes sometimes and I try to acknowledge them when I realize it and and stuff like that, you know? But it is a real like labor of love. And it was a thing where I I just kind of heard what it should sound like in my head before I made it and I couldn't explain it to anybody. So I just had to make it. And there wasn't a model I could point to. There wasn't like something else that sounded like what I was trying to sound like. And so the fact that I was able to just make it at all and pull it off, like get anybody to listen to it and that the feedback is positive is like a dream, you know? I mean, I should just prepare for nothing I ever do to be as successful. (laughs) Going back to like some of the sort of misogyny or some of the criticism, I think I read somewhere that you might have gotten negative comments if you did like some kind of like a superhero action film or something like that. Oh yeah, I mean when I I reviewed the first Avengers for LA Weekly and I got death threats like on Rotten Tomatoes. Whenever I would review a movie like that, I guess I wrote a positive review of the first Iron Man, but generally I was more lukewarm on those types of movies and and I would get feedback that was like why is she even allowed to review this if she doesn't understand it or Things that were either directly or veiled misogyny. And the answer to like why I'm reviewing it is because like the critic who is more powerful than me didn't want to. (laughs) And so like somebody had to. And what would have qualified you for not getting that criticism that, but if you were like a, 
expert in the Marvel universe or? I mean, I think there are women who are experts in the Marvel universe that still get rape threats if they criticize anything in these movies. This is a lot. It's a weird phenomenon. Yeah. That's really crazy. For Star Wars, for Marvel, there are certain audiences out there that don't want to be told that the thing that they love is anything but their version of it and their image of it, you know? Mm. And so even if you're writing an accurate review of these movies, that's like, there's a battle in the middle of it that's 40 minutes long and I didn't understand what was happening. Like, that's not considered a valid criticism to some fans. Mm. Yeah, it all gets back to kind of what people are reading criticism for. I'm curious, actually, in the as I don't know, in the in the restaurant business, what is the place of restaurant critics, both like commercially, like practically, how much do restaurant reviews matter? There isn't really a Rotten Tomatoes for restaurant reviews, is there? Or is there like No, a- but it was an idea I actually started to throw around <laughs> oh, yeah. for the good and the bad. And I think it was interesting because, Karina, you were instrumental in the online movie review thing. And that's a whole nother podcast because I think there's a lot of similarities between the food blogs and the internet sites that reviewed restaurants. And I think it was important simply for the fact that it offered another voice. But it just all happened so fast, mm-hmm. right? So I started cooking year 2000, 1999, 2000. New York Times was the only thing that mattered. Mm-hmm. It literally was, I'm sure, like theater today. Mm-hmm. It was make or break. Like it was just, a, there was no in yeah, between. Yeah. You got a good review, you're going to be in business 10 years. You got a bad review, sayonara. Who Brian. was the f- food critic? It was Ruth Reichel at the time. Yeah. And it was Brian Miller before that. And then William Grimes took it over. And Ruth Reichel was probably one of the best critics of all time because she challenged the establishment as to what a restaurant could be. Hmm. She would like go to Chinatown and review a noodle shop. Yeah. And they had never done that before. Hmm. You know, she gave like three stars to a soba shop. People were like, what? (laughs) And that was so important, I think, to get to where we are today. So criticism can be incredibly important. And then right around Momofugo, around 2004, Frank Bruni was there e-gullet and the chat room started. Mm. Next thing you know, these chat rooms turned into actual websites Mm. and people didn't have to listen to the critic anymore for where to go and what to think. Mm. It became this like hyper-localized thing of what you were interested in. Mm. And New York Times is still incredibly important. Mm. Michelin Guide's there. And that covers a different kind of restaurant. And then you have all these different food sites. And then you have Yelp. And you have to appease all of it. And it's it's a really daunting task for a, a restaurant owner to do. Mm. But if there's a positive to that, it's the fact that you're no longer beholden to just one thing. Right. But it's now infinitely more complex because now you have to juggle all of this stuff. Mm. And Yelp is probably, unfortunately, the most powerful thing in food right now. Wow. Yeah. Much wow. like probably like Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Cooks, they don't read reviews anymore. Like much like yourself, right? I love restaurant criticism. It gives me a sense of what is happening in the world in terms of food. And cooks today, at least in my experience, they don't even read it. They read like some kind of like aggregator yeah. score of that. But isn't Yelp, it's like it's all user reviews. There are people giving like one stars because I don't know, because their seat was sticky or something, right? It's like not exactly like it's the, not, but there's some people that are avid restaurant goers and you can definitely gain information from that. Yeah. But I've spoken a lot about Yelp. There's something terrible and powerful to the idea that if a thousand people review a restaurant, you can't just dismiss it. Right. There's a thousand people that gave some reviews and there's some majority in there that can tell you some important information. Right, right, right. But for a restaurant, I think to take it to a level where it's going to be at its best, you need to take care of the foodies. Mm the hardcore foodies that will travel around the world to eat at the best restaurants. You got to take care of the critics and you have to take care of the average person that just wants to eat. So like Mm -hmm. you want to get that, if it's a Venn diagram, you want to get that overlap right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's incredibly hard to do because Mm -hmm. those are all different kinds of reviews. And that's where I want. I want to, I want to please as many people as possible without being like Applebee's. But how much conscious thought can you actually give to like, and how much does that help even giving conscious thought to it? What does that even mean? I guess what you just described, like pleasing this group, pleasing that group, please do. Is there actually a conscious way in which you engage with, okay, I have to do this to get the critics. I have to do this to get the foodies. I have to do this to. Yeah, I actually, I think (laughs) there is. Yeah. For instance, if I made a dish as if this was like going to be a movie. Yeah. There are some chefs that might just make it Blade Runner. 
Right. <laughs> and as important as that is, it's really going to influence not so many people. Sure. And yeah, you could watch it, but you may not understand all the nuance. Right, 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 right. And then you could make some B-rated yeah. sci-fi movie that will be on like Cinemax direct and it'll appease like the hardcore sci-fi fan. Right. Like I can't remember. There's too many movies like that. Yeah. But then there'll be something like Star Wars. Yeah. Which it, to me, like Wiley Dufresne always calls me a populist. Mm. And for a long compared time- Compared to I, him. Yeah. <laughs> compared to him. And I have nothing but mad respect for Wiley. He's one of my closest friends. Mm. And I think for a long time, I took that as a derogatory statement. Now I'm like, no, I, I, I'm okay with that. I want to make as many people happy as possible with my food. Right. And I view something like Star Wars or Indiana Jones or something like that where- it can be mainstream and still try to make everyone happy as much as possible. So I'm right. not going to say there's a perfect formula for that, but for my goal, I want to be able to make as many, like hit all three of those buckets if I can. Right. Yeah. I guess the thing that I'm just getting at is like, like for example, Star Wars or Indy. I mean, those were born not out of, or at least maybe I have a romanticized version of it in my head. But in that romanticized version, those were not born out of Lucas and Spielberg and Kasdan sitting down and saying, how do we hit these quadrants? They were born out of what did we love growing up? What do we want to see on the screen? And that happened to line. And the, it connected because their own personal instincts lined up with what a lot of people out there grew up loving and connecting with also to me that's yeah i don't know when i eat your your food that's where that come that's where the joy in it comes from too it feels like it's tapping into something that obviously comes from a really personal perspective but that hits all these things in me that line up with it it doesn't feel calculated at all it feels like something that comes from a really pure and hence daring place i guess let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor zip recruiter Every business needs to hire great people, especially in my world of the restaurant industry. It's incredibly difficult to find good people. And one of the best that we've used over the years is ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. They learn what you're looking for, identify the right people with the right experience, and invite them to apply for your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive, so you never miss a great match. The right candidate is out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs, including my own. Right now, many listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Chang, C-H-A-N-G, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Chang. ZipRecruiter.com slash Chang. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Maybe a good transition to from all this criticism talk is yeah. into baseball, right? <laughs> yeah. You guys, I know, Krina, you're a massive Dodgers fan. Yeah, unfortunately right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, They'll have turned it around by the time this podcast airs. <laughs> It'll be, we'll be back. Uh. When I'm talking about like formulating like these three buckets, I'm using that almost like as like sabermetrics or stats where it's there, but I'm not solely dedicated to that. I'm still sure, the yeah. eye test. Right. I, yeah. I want to be dedicated to both my gut and to like real empirical data that I think I can use. Right. It's hard for me to articulate, which goes back to like how this whole conversation started about trying to explain this to the team that's trying to develop a new thing. I'm like, I don't know how to give them the decision-making rights to be like, yeah, screw with this. Don't screw with that. Mm -hmm. It's still something I'm working out in my head because it's sort of clear to me, but it's very hard for anyone else to see that, right? Like we're basically recipe testing it out right now. And the first batches of tests, I was like, this is just to 2008, 2007. Right, 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 right. And for me, I want to get back to a sense of rawness because mm -hmm. that's the barrier of entry that people don't want to go to. For instance, Next time you come, I'd love for you to try these oxtails, mm. right? I think there's something amazing about just the bowl of oxtails. That tells me so much about a person that orders it mm. and a restaurant that leaves it on the bone. Do you put them in the ramen or is it just like a soup? It's just a soup. Mm -hmm. And maybe it comes into a, a bowl of noodles. And that's the fascinating part about doing something like this mm -hmm. is that you don't know where it's going to go. And I'm trying to get my team or them without making it the decision for them is to make a decision that leads to more decisions. Mm. I don't want them to make a decision that becomes a binary decision. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I want these oxtails 
to be something that is not just a statement, but is also nourishing and delicious. And also that another restaurant might not want to put on the menu because it's so gnarly. Right. 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 And yeah. It's so symbolic of so many great things. Yeah. So for instance, the, the, one of the first iterations of this oxtail dish, it was like garnished with all these chives and beautiful, like baby vegetables. And I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not what we're trying to do. And it was like someone trying to actually paint by numbers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not what I want to do. It's got to be sort of a foot yeah. in both worlds. It sounds like you have a really clear sense of like what you're aiming for. With the, <laughs> I mean, what's the, yeah. But the hard part is getting other people to be reckless as well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. something I think that in both your careers, you guys have been, I don't want to say reckless, but risk taking. It comes from the top though. I know that's true on a, on a film set. As a director, you got to kind of step up and take responsibility for setting the tone for everything on the set, not just creatively, but also just like the vibe on set, how it feels on the set that all starts with you, but also creatively. And I think if you've got a really clear sense of that balance that you're going for, that tends to trickle down, I Mm -hmm. think, right? Uh, And I'm trying to get better at explaining that. Yeah. I mean, when you're on set, were you ever a yeller? No, I've never raised my voice on set. I I wish I could. (laughs) Yeah? Are you a yeller? Yeah. I was not prepared. Yeah. And that's not an excuse. No, what is it that like, like, what do you yell in response? Is it that you can't communicate what you want and it's not going I've right learned anymore? over the years, and this has been a lot of work with my psychiatrist because I yeah. couldn't understand what gets me so insanely upset. Yeah. And it's when someone doesn't care about something as much as I do. Mm-hmm. And it could be right. something as frivolous as condensing one container into the other. Right. And right, right. I didn't know how to communicate that. Because when someone does that, I've learned that I internalize it as uh, someone that's like not trusting me or they're trying to take advantage of the situation, even if it's not. So cooking to me is a really screwy thing Yeah, because it gives me great purpose, but it also brings out potentially the worst in myself. Hmm. And working in restaurants coming up, you're not taught how to communicate. Hmm. And I think the thing with a director, which is ironic enough, a chef, you have to learn how to communicate, but there's this preconceived notion that it's not about communication. It's about being this machismo badass that can cook anything and be like Gordon Ramsay. And that's Hmm. just not true. It never really was. Right. And maybe it was, but you're going to burn everyone around you. Yeah. And you're not going to create a really healthy environment. Like the great film, Burn, which I know you love. (laughs) Burn. There's some elements that are good, but- uh. I watched it on a plane. (laughs) Ryan's the only one who hasn't seen it. I haven't seen it. (laughs) There are technical aspects that I can't look at that movie. That's really it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wish I wish I could learn how to not, I mean, I'm trying to get better. Yeah. But I can just imagine you on the set right now, just like being very like. Well, but you're always learning. You're always trying to get better. And there's always room for improvement when it comes to communicating with people. Anytime there's interaction with people, that's a messy you know, There's so many variables. Oh my God. Yeah. And personalities on the set and everything. I think every single day you get to the end of the day and you look back at five interactions you have where you think, oh, I could have done that better. But that's what you do. That's what you do. I don't know. There's no point you hit where that doesn't happen. I, I am the type where I'll get home from a party at the end of the night and I'll go to bed just running over in my mind the five times I messed up in conversation or said something stupid, you know, and beat myself up <laughs> or I, Maybe that's helpful. Maybe it's not. It's probably not very helpful. It's not. (laughs) But at some point, you got to just go to sleep, you know? (laughs) Which is why, like, when I look at what you do, Karina, now with the podcast, that a lot of it is a solo endeavor, even though you have help now. When I was, like, thinking about how you actually process this, to me, it was like, oh, you're, like, one of those great sushi chefs in Japan that doesn't really need anyone, (laughs) and they can just do it on their own. And that is, like infinitely exciting for me because I'm jealous of that, that you can create something as difficult as it is Mm -hmm. on your own. Thank you. I mean, I, that totally just comes from me, like not knowing how to deal with people at all. And like, (laughs) and like every time I've been in a job situation where I report to people and I have people underneath me, like I just fuck up both relationships so badly. (laughs) And so, yeah, the podcast, one of the things that was appealing to me was that it was like, if I can just like produce this completely by myself in my bedroom, then it could be something that I could sustain. And now it's great that I do have help editing it and people who sell ads on it and all of that. But what is also great is that there's nobody telling me what to do. So there's nothing for me to brush up against or like to have friction, you know? Like I can do it exactly my way and I can tell people how to help me do it my way. And occasionally I send pissy emails that I shouldn't send. But like (laughs) I've been really trying over the past few years to be like, 
don't send emails angry. Like, wait until you're not angry anymore and then rewrite the email and send it. These guys should be my therapist, too. Both of them. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is, I think as a person, I have more similarities to your thought process, mm-hmm. Karina, and like how you work. But over the years, I've had to learn to not be that. And right. I would rather just not talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> you <Yep. know? laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, but here I am doing this. I mean, a lot of time I've been asked so many times to do like a live version of my podcast or like, you know, do up the podcast like in conversation or basically change the way that I've I've created this thing that is the only way I feel comfortable doing the thing. And if you change if you change any element of it, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it anymore. But you didn't get to this point without going through many iterations and trying many different things out, right? Well, in my career, I've tried yeah. many different things out. Yeah, for sure. I, mean, I know like, it's not like career advice, but everything that I've read, what I love most is like, I, yeah, I'm going to try to do this. I don't care because if I don't, I'm just going to go back to you know, work in restaurants. I'll make my ends meet somehow, but that's not going to deter me from doing what I want to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, I went through a period in my twenties where I was having like enough success as a freelance writer that my only goal was to just like get a little bit more success so that I could have health insurance. And then once I got there, I was like, my quality of life has not changed so much that I wouldn't be able to just like go back and like work at a wine bar and just do exactly what I want to do in my spare time. Do you guys think since you went to USC for film, you went to NYU for film studies. Was that a necessary step for your careers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, USC. No. I had a great time there. You know, I met some great people, some of whom are still my best friends, you know, and I got to see a lot of great movies. I got to make a lot of movies, but necessary. Did it no. teach you how to think? Did actual school yeah. teach me how? You mean about or was it movies? On your own, right? Like No, the only way you learn how to make movies is by watching movies and making them. You don't learn it in a classroom. They can teach you how to work a camera. You can learn that on your own with a camera manual in a week. So no. But film school gave me an opportunity, like four years time out from life, to watch a lot of movies and make a lot of my own movies. But end of the day, you can list off all the great filmmakers never went to film school. It's not something as necessary, I think. Similar to cooking school, I think. Did you go to cooking school? You? I did, yeah. but I didn't know any better. I thought that's what you had to do. <laughs> yeah. I think you would have learned as much just working in a really good kitchen, I mean, which is what I did anyway for free for a little bit. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's about getting repetitions and getting great mentors. Right. Right? Yeah. But I think for me, what was important was learning how to think in college. Like critical thinking, I think, has been a real game changer for me in food hmm. and with film school like i always wish i could go to a graduate program but that's mm-hmm. never going to happen now like yeah. did you go to nyu thinking that oh now i'm going to know how to think about movies in a different way well i went to graduate school at nyu because i didn't know what else to do i mean i finished undergraduate i went to art school the kind of work i was doing in art school like was not really being well received in the art world And if YouTube had existed, I would have just put it on YouTube and it would have found an audience, but it was like three years too early. So I was just like, I don't know what to do. I'll apply to graduate schools and then maybe I'll get some scholarship money. And so that's what happened. And I ended up moving to New York. Then I did two years of graduate school, got my degree and I stayed there. I think that similar to Ryan, like I could do everything I do without having gone to graduate school, but it put me sort of in the right place at the right time for all of these other experiences to happen. When did you guys both feel that you were going to be, you had enough confidence to do it? You mean, right. when will we feel that? Yeah. <laughs> or, I mean, we, we spoke about this in uh, South by Southwest a little bit, right? I, yeah. I think we spoke a little bit about imposter syndrome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Do you no, guys was, ever feel like, ah, I'm good. I can do this now. No, but I was more confident when I was younger. Like in my 20s, I was like, I know better than anybody. And like, I don't want to do things in like the format that film criticism is in. I want to break the format and, you know, I want to invent new things. And I did some things that were silly, (laughs) but I learned from it. And now I'm just like, now I've, I don't have as much confidence as I did 10 years ago, for sure. Is that because you have more wisdom? Maybe. I don't know. I think I've like had enough success that I'm afraid that I'll do something that'll make it all go away. And I know that that probably won't really happen as long as I'm not like racist or anything. <laughs> but like, yeah, I don't know. You never know. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, would you consider your what you're doing now with, um, you must remember this, more of like the humanities? Because this is something I've always had 
conversation with annoyingly with everyone that does something creative. I want to know when you're at your best, yeah. right? Because mm-hmm. I want to plan for that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and cause I never want to be the athlete that is like, Oh, I can still do this. And I'm not, I want to be able right. to transition out. Well, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to do the podcast forever. And I'm trying to write a TV show. I just finished writing a book that I've been writing for three years and I mean, there's often, honestly like a lot writing on the book, like in terms of like whether or not anybody's going to continue to take me seriously. So, but because you think that way is probably why it's going to be a great book. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But I mean, I'm very proud of it. It is like the best I can do. So, what's pushing you then still? Because, um, like, when I look at you, I'm like, wow, she's had an incredibly distinguished career. I love when I read somewhere that you're like, oh, I wasn't a great professor. Like, very few no, people yeah, would it was terrible. say that. Like, that's an honesty that is amazing. Although it's funny, like I, I've been working with an agent and his assistant was my student. Wow. And she was like, you introduced me to Jim Jarmusch and like, thank you. And I think that she was the only person in that class who was happy to be introduced to Jim Jarmusch. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm. what's pushing me, I, I have to say that like, I still enjoy doing the podcast, but it's not as challenging as it was a few years ago. And and what excites me is the idea of trying to do things that I've never done before. And Does so, it say something bad about me that I, I love the Charles Manson no, Season. a lot of people do. It's very popular. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're like a creepy cult person. I just think it's super fascinating. It's if yeah. you haven't listened to it, they're all amazing, right? Thank the, you. The Bella and uh, yeah. Oh my god, what's his name? Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff. Oh yeah. my gosh. So good. <laughs> Most recent season. Um, yeah. What about with you? Directors like chefs have a specific career arc. Yeah. Right. Like. I believe that they're at the creative peak from the ages of like 27 to 32, right? There's like a five-year window. And then after like 45, it just flattens out into a different arc completely. Always? Not always. There are exceptions to the rule, but part of it is I think it's just accumulation of wisdom that prevents you from doing the risky things that you thought you could do. I think you're a better chef, but you're maybe approaching things differently. And I think as a filmmaker, I've always wondered like, is that something you get better at with more knowledge or you're taking less risks? Well, I think it, I mean, the interesting for me, I never expected to be successful as a filmmaker. I was always just kind of like, God, I hope I can make a movie. And then God, I hope I can make another movie. Having now made a Star Wars movie and had like some degree of success to me, that question that you asked is tied up in kind of the career arc question. And what Karina brought up earlier, which I think is the real bear trap is the sense of, oh my God, I've got hold of this pot of gold. I got to hold on to it tight so I don't lose it. And how that affects your creative decisions going forward. And that's But it's like a weird line between like being insecure and holding on to it and being afraid to take risks and then having hubris and like thinking you can get away with anything. Well, but I I don't know. I've, I've just in my own head been trying to really kind of, and part of this involves like trying to... I'm failing at it, but trying to unplug from the internet a little bit, trying to Mm. unplug from this kind of idea of yourself out there as a bigger idea, as a bigger thing than anything that is just you sitting alone in your room, having your thoughts, you know, and trying to retreat back into the reason I was doing stuff back when I was a teenager, you know, just like trying to get back to what's exciting to me and whether or not it's going to continue the same kind of commercial success or whatever, trying to kind of let that go. And that probably means I'll end up making a movie. <laughs> like, I don't know. I would probably have like some huge failure and then desperately try and make something commercial again. I don't know. But that right now that feels like the only kind of vibrant, creatively vibrant thing to to go after. If that makes sense. I feel like no, I'm not does, explaining this Are well. you trying to like, maybe like always one up what you've done or maybe do something always. different? You know? Well, always. Yeah. I mean, there, always you are, I think. But after I made Looper, for me, it was an indie movie, but it was still kind of on that level. It was a success. And I got really freaked out because I thought I got to make something that was, it, there's also this weird thing where when a movie comes out and it gets written about, especially when it gets written about positively, that can be more damaging to you than yes. the negative reviews. Because then suddenly it's no longer this thing that you were making that you cared about and you were building up block, block, block. Suddenly it becomes this kind of golden orb in the <laughs> sky that all these people are saying these wonderful things are. And it suddenly becomes something that you don't even feel like came out of you. You're like, I don't know how that happened. I can't do that again. How do I do better than that? You know? Um, and that's what can really fuck you up, I think. You know, I mean, the bad criticism hurts, but that's what can really paralyze you creatively. To me, that's almost the bigger danger. I 
can empathize with that 100% <laughs> in so many ways. I bet. Because yeah. I try not to think about any compliments whatsoever, yeah. which is not healthy yeah. either. I mean, like, we all just want approval, but then it doesn't, like, fill the hole when we right. get it. Well, it's never ending. Well, I don't want to talk forever, but I wanted to finish this on, on, on one thing that wasn't about what we're talking about. You guys have lived in L.A., New York, Paris, London. So where do you prefer to live? They're all different places, but like, where is the best food for you? Paris. Paris? Yeah. Cheese? Yeah. yeah we love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Korean is a big cheese. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I put food. myself through grad school selling cheese at Dina DeLuca. So, but yeah, I mean, I like it here too. I, I love the restaurants in LA. I love the restaurants in New York. I mean, I like to live in LA. Like if we had like our ideal situation, we'd spend like maybe two months of the year in Europe and the rest of the time here. Mm. I love friend. I love the food in Paris, but I gotta say, if I could take the food from Italy and stick it, it in Paris, Paris that <laughs> yeah. would be the perfect city in the world. I mean, we're just pasta people. Yeah. But. What? About, because you guys are like, you guys cook a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Karina's an amazing cook. Ryan's good at following recipes, and I'm better at just being <laughs> like, we have four things in the fridge, and it's like, true. I will make dinner out of them. I like the cooking equivalent of the elaborate Lego set, where you know exactly <laughs> yeah. what you're. I seen you with a water circulator (laughs) on Instagram. Um, With Paris, how do you get like all the other types of food that you can't get? Like, are you Mm. satisfied with just eating Parisian food? I did miss Korean food when we were there for like four months. I missed just going to Koreatown. And there's no Mexican food. There's some. Well, yeah, it's more like (laughs) Spanish food in tortillas. Maybe if we lived there full time, then I would have more of a problem with it. But because the produce is so great, mm-hmm. like the markets are so great, if you are craving something, you can sort of make it. You might not be able to get the right sauce or the right seasonings, but. And what do you do if you're in Paris and Dodgers games? Like, do you watch oh, those? I How would, do you do that? I mean, so oh. it would be a big deal when they would play early because if they play at like one o'clock in LA, it's like, you know, eight or 9 p.m. in Paris. And so you could like make dinner and then watch the game on Sunday nights. But yeah, I mean, most of the games I couldn't watch live unless I had insomnia. We'd be up a lot at three in the morning listening to games. That would happen a lot. <laughs> I would say, you know, sometimes like you'll wake up a little bit too early. Like you'll wake up at like five in the morning and you should just go back to sleep and you could if you tried. But instead I would just like listen to the game. Yeah. Do you have a favorite food city? Could you even say if you did or you got too many? Tokyo is, is always still the best, but yeah. that's such a sort of obnoxious answer. I think, <laughs> I think LA is great for all the immigrant food. I don't think there's a city in America that can even come close to the diversity of what LA can offer. Yeah. New York, it's its own thing, right? But food is better than ever in every city in the world. Mm. I don't know it'll it'll ever have the vibe of Paris and getting those products and mm. the butter. I mean, to yeah. me, it's all about the dairy. The dairy. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did not love living in London, but the eggs there are just insane. <laughs> They're like orange. Fantastic. I want that on like a poster at Heathrow when those big walk. I did not love living in London, but the eggs are insane. And just you like shrugging. <laughs> well, don't want to talk forever and I could easily do it. But Karina, thanks for coming on board. We'll thanks for having probably me. have you. I'd love to have you back when you launch your new season. Sure. And uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. Mr. Chang, thanks for having us, man. This was fun. This is the first time we've done any kind of thing in front of microphones together. Yeah. I think it went well. Yeah, let's do more joint interviews. Just at home. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Rupert Pupkin style. Just set we're gonna set up a like placard of you (laughs) and just pretend. (laughs) Um yeah, this is this has been fun. This is a new thing for me. So uh, I will get better at this. You did great. You did great. great. Thank you guys. It's the David Chang show. (laughs) Ryan's gonna sing your jingle right now. That's it, guys. Thanks for listening to the Dave Chang Show. Please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts. Five stars. Imagine I'm your Uber driver and we have an agreement that we both give each other five stars. That would be great. I never want to disappoint Bill Simmons or my own father for that matter. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.